Hi, I'm Georgette Pierre, and you're listening to Black and Nuance Podcast, dispelling the idea that Black people are monolithic. <clears throat> okay, so it was a random drop in, spiritual download, if you will, that I needed to do an episode on grief. My cousin and I, whom you'll hear from shortly, often exchange voice notes on the rag about random and personal shit. It only made sense that the penultimate episode explores some of the grief I had been experiencing beyond just the loss of a loved one. I spoke about it throughout the season, but in episode two, the solo episode, I mentioned falling into a dark space. I later realized I was grieving this life I thought I should have been living in my late 30s. I looked up and nothing was as I wanted it to be. Finances were in shambles. Mindset around finances were more in shambles. I said yes to a junior position that started catching up to me ego-wise. I'm overextended with the things I have to pay for and not feeling like enough money was coming in. I was over people, places, and things, not necessarily in that order. Everything and everybody was clipped, as my cousin would say. My cousin's mother had transitioned in the fall of 2022, and there are moments that I still think about my sister Iona, who became an ancestor in June 2015. It was time to face some of this grief head on. What were we taught about the grieving process? Where did we learn how to grieve? Shit, what are we still grieving? Everything, child. Entanglements and all. But most importantly, what does it look and feel like on the other side of grief? I'm not really sure there, for me, is another side of it, right? Like, what does the other side of heartbreak look like? Well, we can, we can try and, like, think about that in a macro way, but when I think about this one person and the heartbreak I experienced with them, is there really an other side of it? When I think about my mom and the grief that, that you know, has come from her passing, is there really another side of it? Do I want there to be a, another side? Or is grief just the thing that now happens, um, and it doesn't have to be a bad thing or a good thing, it's just the thing that is a part of the remembrance of the um, the memorialization of, of everything else that we do when someone dies. So it's like, does this ever really stop? I don't think it does, but before we dive in further, please introduce yourself to the collective, cuz. So um, I am known by a couple of names, but for all intents and purposes, my name is Sean and I go by Seanathan. Um, and yeah, like, um, it's good to be here. I love it. I love it. Um, so we have known each other. You had this story down packed the first time we were recorded this. We, uh, we recorded this. We met, oh gosh, we're in the 20 year range now, right? Yeah. Uh, what is this? 2023, 2003. That's yeah. Like, oh, no, 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 96. 2013. 96, 20. 97, because I went to eighth yeah, this grade. Yeah, like 25 plus years. <sighs> yeah, I mean, so I, on the in my notes for this, I wrote I wrote Carrie Dell Tings, right? Uh, T i n g s Tings, and okay. yeah, that was where I met you. I met you on Carrie Dell at my cousin's house, um, my biological cousin. Yeah. Back in, I guess it was like 97, 98. And I was, I'm younger than G for all the listeners who may not know by a couple years. And so I was like younger, kind of like a kid, annoying, the annoying little cousin. And yeah, like I got introduced to you and your sister Iona, actually. I think it's like the same day. And, you know, it was like one of those few times when you're a kid and you go somewhere without your parents but you're with family and you're like seeing the world a little bit differently because there's like a different level of awareness that comes with that. So yeah. Um, and sidebar, I just have a really great memory. Everyone that knows me knows this. I remember details. I remember colors. I remember scenarios really, really well. Um, we joked offline about me having the memory of an elephant <laughs> and Georgette was like, wait, do elephants have really lot? I was like, yeah, girl, they like have like some of the best memories out of all of the animals in the kingdom. So, oh, wow. yeah, yeah. But anyway, yeah, I've known you for over 25 years and, um, we are extended family. Uh, we are chosen family, I should say, uh, via my biological family. So, yeah. You know, jumping right in, though, because I want to talk about how we have learned to grieve. And I know it's been really different. I, You know, I think 
there's a lot of things from a cultural standpoint of like how black people, black families grieve um, uh, compared to other cultures. And do you recall how you learned to grieve and, and, and what, quote unquote, how sadness was introduced to you? Um, whether it was younger or like the death of a loved one happened, curious. Yeah, I'm, you know, I was. I, I like to think about things in a more macro way because I understand that my lived experience is not everyone else's. And so I'll speak about myself and I'll also speak about what I've, you know, viewed from my perspective when it comes to grief. But I think, yeah, I was definitely taught to grieve when it applies to death and loss of a loved one. Um, around the age, I think, of three or four, my grandfather had passed, which is my biological cousin's grandfather also. And because I lived in a multi-generational household, um, we lived in a, in a two-family house. Grow- I Actually, my entire life, I lived in a two-family house. Um, my grandmother and grandfather were downstairs, and me and my mom were upstairs. There were two separate apartments. And so grow, you know, for the first three, four years of my life, I had like three parents, right? Like my dad was in and out, but he wasn't necessarily a staple, but I had my mom, I had my grandfather and I had my grandmother. And um, so I was really lucky that I had that extra layer. Also, you know, back then my biological family was a lot closer. So there were like uncles in and out and whatever. But the first death that I had to contend with was my grandfather. And he was for all intents and purposes, my dad. He was my father, right, figure um, up until that point. And he died suddenly of a heart attack. He wasn't that old. Um, And it was the first time that I think I remember my mom crying, like, violently in front of me. Um, And me understanding that something had changed and that I was having these feelings. And my mom, you know, letting. I remember the car and everything we were in. And she was holding me and telling me it's okay to let it go. And, you know, as a little black boy then, um, I understand how, like, pivotal in just being able to feel and express emotion that was for me. Because some people don't allow their little boys, certainly their little black boys, to fully realize their their emotions in such a full body way at such an early age, right? We're taught to, to man up, to be this and to be that. And not to say that I was never told that, but in that particular moment around grief and around loss, um, I felt like my my mom specifically held my hand through it and allowed me the space to really feel all the feelings, if you will. So that part. But to answer the broader broader question, I'm not really sure that there is one right way to, to teach anyone how to grieve. And I'm not sure that grief and or loss and or death is something that most people in the Western world even want to speak about or acknowledge too much. So I think that a lot of people are left to their own vices to learn how to grieve. And I think that can manifest in healthy ways and unhealthy ways. Um, And, you know, you can name all those ways. But the overarching thing is I think it's an individual thing. It is a very personal thing, grief in in and of itself. Um, And then the way that we are kind of socialized to grieve, I think definitely, again, it depends on your lived experience. But I think we I think it's important that we do have the conversation around grief and and learn tools, at least, to deal with grief. Mm. The way that we are socialized to grieve, it it makes me think about how my my family has not grieved Iona, Mm. Uh, my sister that passed on. She's about a year and a half older than me, and she um, transitioned at 32. Mm. I used to always have this thing, Forever 32. Yeah. Uh, and to this day, no one talks about it. Her birthday's coming up. As we're recording this, it's March 27th. Her birthday's are April 2nd, so she was an April baby, just like you. There okay. is. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> April 8th here. I didn't know that about her. I love that. Yeah. April 2nd. And so, um, you know, it... Um, and and I, just to give full context, my family is from the islands. Caribbean culture also adds another layer of oppression of communication on how they see kids and things of that nature. Like you're you're to be seen, not heard. Mm-hmm. And, um, and you know, I think about what my parents, what was probably projected onto them. And so I remember, I remember even since she's been gone for seven years, going on eight years in June. Uh, no one would bring 
when they would bring her name up, it would almost be around like, yeah, I only used to do this, but no one ever wanted to talk about what happened, how they were feeling. Like they would bring it up like around significant dates. Like we celebrate the birthday, we celebrate the day that she transitioned, which was also, which is also my brother's birthday. Wow. Right. So, you know, there are, there are, there are times where I offer my mom grace cause she'll, she'll, I'll see certain things trigger her if she thinks like it's certain behaviors that we're reminiscent of. I want to keep things to herself, which led to like what she thinks led to this, her being in stage four and not doing something about it sooner. And so grieving for me was just like, I had to figure this shit out. Yeah. Right? Whatever mm. felt comfy to me, whatever I defined as comfy and what, whatever level of vulnerability and capacity that I had, I had to figure it out. Yeah. It was like coming to my parents and, and crying you know, I, I, I remember when she passed, like I tried to hold it in and I was doing so well. And, um, you know, then something happened at the funeral and I broke down like completely. And I didn't tell any girlfriends. I didn't tell anyone from high school. People like from, co no, people found out later. They're like, you know, Georgette's sister died. And, and they were like, Georgette didn't say anything. Like, that's how I handle it. I didn't want more people to know because I knew that I was not going to be able to hold back tears or fight those tears. And then I was very protective of Iona as time was nearing because anyone that said anything about my sister, like if you didn't know her, her name should be coming out your motherfucking mouth. Like that. I, was, I totally understand that. Okay? But that was literally kind of my energy knowing what she was navigating. And so how I handle grief now, I'm still, I'm still learning. Like, Grief or lo loss of a loved one, to me, has felt like different, differing stages than it is like grieving friendships, grieving relationships, yeah. grieving people that are still alive or grieving the uh, life that you thought you were going to live. There's some, there's some intersection or, you know, crossover because, mm -hmm. but I don't, I, I haven't fully, I'm not going to say like to say to master grief, but I don't think I fully understood the the breath of like really mourning my sister yeah yeah and i mean i think that a lot of people think when they think about grief they automatically think about death but loss is i think the word that really permeates my mind when i think about grief it is really loss it can have such a range of emotions attached to it Again, I really don't think that, at least in the Western world, we like to think about loss or losing or death or anything that reminds us of our mortality in that way, because, yeah, it forces you to contend with a whole lot of other things that are going on under the umbrella of existence. And not for nothing, a lot of us are trying to make it day to day, so we don't have the time or the energy or we don't want to allot the the time or the energy to these elusive thoughts that we can't really measure or name sometimes as a means to survive so it, it's i don't think there's anything wrong with you know not knowing how to grieve or you know understanding grief but i think that the more time goes on the more information that you know, is, is disseminated, the more things are studied, the more people are communicating and talking around and about these things, such as grief and loss, I think it'll, it'll make it easier for at least us to have some common ground in the process. And I know we're going to get into that more later about whether or not there's an ending or, or an, uh, an after grief time period. But yeah, I think that uh, it's good that we're talking about it. Yeah, you know, it, it makes me think about other things that we as human beings may be, may be grieving. Something that loudly came up for me, so November 2022, really right after Thanksgiving, December 2022 through February, I just, I, I was in this dark space dark place. I just, I didn't know what was going on because I couldn't name it. I couldn't put my finger on it. I didn't know. I was just feeling something. And so I remember journaling. So I started seeing a therapist now, got my therapist in February and, um, of 2023. And I remember journaling and what I realized, cause what was happening 
that I think was that I was able to connect the dots to from like a maybe spiritual standpoint was like I was grieving, mm-hmm. right? I was grieving this life that I sh- thought I should have been living by the age of 30 something, kakaka, right? Yes. I was grieving, not knowing if I was going to accomplish the life that I wanted, not seeing the light at the end of the tunnel. Um, not feeling the same way about people anymore, not knowing if the things that I want for my life were going to ever happen. It just, it came rushing through. But but moving through it, there was no language for it. Mm. On the other side of it, I was even grieving like, should I even be so attached to living in New York anymore if that is going to stunt my growth of what I want to do? And everyone knows me and they think about New York Georgette's the, the the face that comes up. Like I wear New York on my back. Like I, I I'm from here. So I'm curious if there are other things that you found yourself grieving, maybe by like happenstance, like you were consciously aware of or unconsciously aware of and, and how were you, or if you still are moving through it? Yeah. So, I mean, obviously I'm still grieving my mom. Um, she passed in September of 2022. So It hasn't even been a year. Um, And she would, just to give a quick outline, we had a very stressed, strained relationship, but we were also simultaneously like best friends in a way. So we were super close. I'm an only child also. So that adds to that. I'm her only son. So yeah, like it's, it's, it's really interesting because it's more around her not being here and me not having access to her in this physical form, but because of the way that she allowed me to feel feelings and and we really had a lot of deep conversations over the years from when I was a kid about like death and sexuality and, uh, and, and gender identity and relationships and family and money and education and hierarchy and just anything that you could really name even when it would, you know, become a knockdown, drag out fight about it, you know, especially when I got older and started having an opinion, it was like the access was still there. And so now that it's it's not there where I can like call, you know, pick up the phone and call her or like text her or email her. And I can do all those things because I have access to all those channels, but the response, you know, doesn't exist. So definitely my mom. Um, also, I was in a situationship Back in summer of 2020, yeah, these these good old entanglements. Um, It's 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 a it's an interesting part of life, but uh, yeah, I was in a situation shit back in summer of 2021, and I thought this might have been my person, you know, uh, or at least one of my like main people on the romantic tip, and you know, it was a situation that got really really. heavy for me at least right so you never really know how the other person's feeling you can only trust what they tell you and I was really ready to be all in with this person and things went left ultimately I decided to walk away from this person romantically platonically and otherwise because I felt like this person was gaslighting me I felt like this person was uh emotionally and verbally abusing me And I felt like if I was going to be the bitch that I profess to be (laughs) in real life, then there was, there was no possible way in this dimension on this planet at this point in time that I was going to try to stay in any semblance of that relationship. So as you know, a wise person once said, it's clipped. And so, you know, but it doesn't negate the fact that I, still almost two years later you know i still grieve for maybe the good moments the good times right the 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 wanderlust of it all right the like thinking of where can this go like where will this take us you know both physically emotionally spiritually spiritually all that and then mourning for the future that never was you know what i mean like it's like this sounds so like poetic and shit, but it's not. These are things that I think a lot of people um, contend with around relationships, but some of us just have a, a more, I guess, uh, abstract way of putting it. Um, and then one of the last things that I would mention 
would be um, childhood and youth. Um, you know, I'm at an age, 35, where I'm starting to see signs of like, like aging, you know, like the gray hairs, you know, the gravity setting in in certain places, right? <laughs> and, um, you know, and it's like, while I do have a, have a very youthful and, you know, fun and, and childlike demeanor in my everyday life, it doesn't negate the fact or it doesn't refute the fact that, you know, everyone's aging on this planet. You know, time is not linear in the universe, but on planet Earth, we have a way to measure time and it's in years and it's in months and it's in days and it's in hours and minutes and seconds. And so it's something to think about. And so I think maybe a part of that is like regret. You know, like there are some things that if I could go back and do them differently, I would. And I think that that's probably one of the realest things I, I've i ever come to terms with regarding myself, because I think a lot of people say, oh, well, you know, have no regrets. Yeah, I don't know about that. Not for me. And so, yeah, because there's a, there's a few of those things. Whether or not I'm going to let them rule my world is a different conversation, but I can still grieve for the little boy, you know, the, the they, them, the non-binary teenager of me, you know, exploring my sexuality, exploring my gender, exploring the world, um, not really knowing what the right choice is, having all of these external factors to, to add into it while making these decisions and just thinking like, I wish that me at 35 could meet me at 15 or 17 and be like, look, all of that, all of that, all of that over there, cut it out. This is what you want to do. This is what you need to do. This is who you are. And you already know that. So stick to your guns and do what you got to do. So I grieve for that. I grieve for that. One thing I make, one way I can make amends with, uh, um, the one way I can make amends of that or make amends with that is by attempting to be a vessel for other young people as I come, you know, as I come in contact with them, whether it be on a personal level or a public level, you know, just like being out in the world. How am I navigating? How am I showing up? How am I being? an example of the values and politics that I align with, right? In order to make sure that potentially no one or at least someone else who is having the same thoughts that we all have when we're teenagers and coming of age have just, you know, maybe one person I can affect them in some way where they're like, you know what, that person is who I want to be when I get older and this is what I'm going to do to get there, right? So, yeah, I mean... I think grief is a part of life and not to be too long winded, but yeah, you could people, places and things you can grieve. Right. And then some people believe that we even grieve past lifetimes. So if you want to get into that. So, yeah. There was a couple of things that you said that I felt very parallel to um, the entanglement, the situation ship mm-hmm. right? being, being gaslit. I know for me with, with, with that person, I thought one, I thought, the whole resolve around the pressures, societal pressures of, Georgia, you're, you're this age, you should be married with children or if you want all of that, right? But even if I didn't want marriage, in my mind, I thought similarly that the person that I was going to be with was going to be the person I was going to be with. But Sean, I'm so glad that that didn't happen because I still hadn't even started the healing process, even dealing with them. I was still um, dissociated. Mm. from from my body. And so fast forward, when you started talking about the grieving of like the childhood, you know, you know, personally, the things that I have privately, the things that I have navigated. And I don't think I'm done grieving, giving away my twenties and the first half of my thirties. And I'm not mad. What I am, what I am working through is what does that look like for me at 38 and giving myself more grace than I think people are willing to offer me that may not have understood what I was navigating at that time because I didn't know what I was navigating. Absolutely. And I think that is a, 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 a macro group that I'm navigating because I'm just like, shit, y'all have had these experiences earlier than me. I'm coming into this now or it doesn't look like the way that y'all are moving through it because I'm moving at a different pace than you all. Mm-hmm. But it's just, on Georgette just not being there with you all or it looking different for Georgette. And I don't think that that has ever um, 
I don't think that there's always been um, grace around someone else's journey, at least as it relates to me. And I think that's also been something that I've grappled with too. Um, but the but the the younger self, mm-hmm. I, I mean, like I gave so much power away to people that weren't deserving of it, to things, to, to circumstances. And now I'm over here like I move and speak from a place of sovereignty, but that even still requires me to show up a, a certain way every day, Sean, right? Like I still have to start, you know, from scratch all over again. I remember, yeah. I don't remember the quote, but it was basically saying like everyone, you don't wake up happy. You still have to work at those things, right? Like you still got to, you know, I'm, yes, I'm grateful that I am alive and well, I'm still in the waking world, but there are still things that I have to actively navigate. And so yeah, made me think about, you know, how like during the, the dark place that I was in, I was interrogating my relationships to people, places and things. And so mm-hmm. yeah, I just, yeah, I just wanted to kind of nod to like just some of the two experiences that I was able to parallel with you around the, the, the entanglement. Negroes gonna be Negroes. Uh, Girl, aren't they? Yeah, you know what, just real quick while we're on this, one of yeah. the things that came to the forefront of my mind when uh, I'm like low key a movie buff and similar to the way that you said pe- people think about New York and they think about you, when people think about California, they think about me. And right at this very moment, I'm sitting in LA and I'm not a movie person. I'm not an actor. I'm not a musician. I am an artist for all intents and purposes, but movies are something that I've always been into. And I've, I would, I'm kind of like a diet movie buff. And one of the movies that I, that just came to mind was Antoine Fisher. And in the movie, I think he quotes a poem And in the poem, it goes loosely, who will cry for the little boy, the little boy inside the man? And and I'm going to just go ahead and put little girl in that. Who will cry for the little girl, the little girl inside the woman, you know? Mm -hmm. Because we all have that that inner child that, I mean, maybe some people just compartmentalize and never think about it, but I'm always heartbroken for the child inside of me that did not have someone Mm -hmm. to say or to show or to prove or to protect or whatever. And it's like, I don't think that that's an anomaly. I don't think that that's just a me thing. I, I think that that's just the thing. Um, and so, yeah, like, it's like, who will cry for that child? And by cry, we don't necessarily mean tears. It's like, who will protect that child? Who's going to, you know, finally, you know, help that child through everything that they've gone through, that they're going through, and recognizing that that child is still you. <laughs> they didn't go anywhere. Uh, mm-hmm. So, you know, yeah, grieving is, grieving is maybe like a, an omnipresent thing, and, it, and, it's, and it's very much real time, I think, for a lot of people who have, in, and I think most people have, um, endured some sort of loss, so. Yeah, and when you said that with the little girl inside of the woman that's still you know, us or me or whoever. I I thought about my mother when you said that. Yeah. Learned some things later that she, she had navigated and dealt with. Yep. Um, And they never, you know, there was this episode, um, Evian Whitney, they have uh, a podcast. Now it's called the sensual self, but it used to be called the sexually, sexually liberated woman. And there was an episode they had um, that literally, it was about like, I forgot what it was called, but it was essentially talking about how our ancestors did not have time for pleasure. The episode is called Intergenerational Pleasure featuring Juju Bay. And one aspect of their conversation was talking about honoring the pleasure practices of our ancestors. It's episode 57 of The Sensual Self, and it's absolutely worth the listen. I'll put a link in the show notes. And what does that mean to us now being able to really explore it in a different way than they were able to. And that really stuck with me. Like that really made me think about things completely differently. Cause you know, in a previous episode, I talked about my pleasure and healing journey and um, that really allowed me to start exploring what my views were around pleasure, decolonizing my views around pleasure, right? Expanding my views on pleasure. Yeah. Thinking about, people just were at limited capacity. So what do we do then? Yeah. Um, how do we show up for them? How do we navigate, you know, honoring ourselves and our boundaries, but still giving room for people to be able to, to um, have the grace that they may not have been given or the tools 
you know, that we're learning to have in our generation. So sure. Yeah. And um, I just like the name that like, I think this generational trauma is definitely something that is not specific to people that are descendants of slaves like us, right? Whether that it been in the Americas, South America, Central America, you know, North America, the Caribbean, um, wherever your folks were when they were, you know, um, it, it is a very particular sort of uh, generational trauma around that, right? You know, obviously, there's been poor people and marginalized people throughout time, but there is a particular thing that is descendants of slaves like us um, that we that we have ingrained in our DNA because at a point our ancestors were dehumanized. Mm -hmm. So the idea of pleasure wasn't even a real thing for us on the greater scale or the uh, or, or on the world stage or from a from a, a even a species standpoint, we were we were deemed less than human. And so just let that sink in as we try to navigate this nouveau world of 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 pleasure and you know dismantling all the trauma that you know I don't even have to go that far back. Like you were saying you thought about your mom when you when we when I mentioned the mm -hmm. the Antoine Fisher quote. Exactly. You know, one of the things that I'm grieving about most with my mom is the heartbreak in and around things that she had to endure when she was younger. Um, and it was, you know, it's, 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 it's not lost on me that some of those things are the reason why I'm so liberated. Like she dealt with a lot of backlash about her sexuality. She dealt with a lot of backlash around her gender identity she just had a lot of backlash being the youngest girl of four boys and, and, and understanding that she was not really wanted, right? Finding out later in life that she was not planned, not wanted, and that there were some very physical, real world things that happened to try and have her not be here. And so like when my heart breaks, it breaks for, it, it does break for, for, for my my mother and my grandmother, and and per potentially their mother, and and all of the the black women that have had to endure the generations of of, of just surviving, right? And then also our you know my father and his father and his father, and and them not being able to express emotions and feelings and trying to do the best they can with whatever they have in a world that is inherently shown themselves to be or itself to be against them it's a lot and then now with my black queer pansexual flamboyant self i'm, I'm out here you know tr trying to be sexually liberated trying to you know navigate the world trying to navigate capitalism try to keep fucking sane and it's just like understanding that there was so much that went into that for me to even be able to like <laughs> play in that, you know, that in that liberation, you know, niggas couldn't even think about who they wanted to fuck <laughs> back in the day. It was like, you know, I, I don't have time to think about that. Like I got, I got bills to pay. I'm trying to like stay alive. You know, I'm trying to keep I'm sane and, you know, and, and I'm trying to be black, like just regular shit. And we out here trying to, you know, and so it's, it's a, it's a gift that we are able to like be on the other side of that, if you will. But for me, and I think for you and people like us who are very reflective and are always seeking understanding and knowledge and, and, and just up trying to just understand where we came from. It's, it, you just can't, you can't overlook the grief and the, and the trauma that has come with a lot of that journey for, for our ancestors. So yeah, that's a it's a lot, but it is a lot. Is a lot. And and uh, it's the exploring piece and really wanting to continue unpacking it for me and what that means as well. Yeah, exactly. What does the other side of grief look like? 
for you at least? Yeah. So um, again, my I think my most recent bout with like some real measured grief was the loss of my mom. And one of the things that is helping me through the grief process with dealing with her or as it relates to her is thinking about what it is that she wanted for me uh, before she left this earth in her physical form. And luckily, for better or for worse, my mom and I would talk about some very difficult things. Sometimes I didn't want to talk about it. Sometimes she didn't want to talk about it, but we would talk about it. And she made it very clear the day she got diagnosed that her her number one priority and her and her only worry, her like top worry was for me and how I was going to be after she was no longer here. And she was very adamant and very vocal about wanting me to continue my life, about reaching whatever height I wanted to reach, doing anything that I wanted to do, not to worry about her, not to stop life and to continue living. And it's very on brand for my mom. Like I said, she wasn't the best mom on the planet. She wasn't the worst mom on the planet, but she was my mom. And she, from day one, emphasized that I could do whatever I wanted to do, be whoever I wanted to be, and live my life the way that I wanted to live my life. And so knowing that and knowing the conversations that we had towards the end um, of her physical manifestation um, in this universe and on this planet, I know that I can be sad that she's not here anymore, but in the next breath, if she was sitting right here, she'd be like, all right, what's next? What you got going on? What you finna do? Like, you like you ain't dead. What's go- what's, what you doing? Like, and so I, I like, it's, it's, a, it's a very fine line between grief and triumph because I know that she was always my biggest cheerleader. And she, I know if there is a place and an existence and a time or a space where she is able to um, shift anything in this physical world in my favor, I know she's doing it. And so, yeah, like I find some peace of mind in that for sure. I love so, that. yeah, but are getting it on. Yes. And like, and you know, you know, I was, I was going to mention this earlier, but I'm glad you brought Iona back up. When Iona was dealing with um, her health issues towards the end of her, her physical life on this planet, her and I actually had some interactions. It wasn't a lot. And it was actually around the time that I had just moved to LA. This was like o- over 10 years ago. Um, and she, we would play Fruit Ninja on, <laughs> in the Apple, like, you know, this is before people were really like up on Apple games and stuff. And like, we would religiously play Fruit Ninja. And we even had a few conversations. And I remember, and then we also... It's also why I'm so um, vocal about alternative medicine, because I remember around that time, without getting into too many details, she was seeking alternative means of medicine, some that were uh, classified as Schedule 1 drugs, or, you know, they were kind of like, Mm -hmm. I think it's Schedule 1, I think that's what the Class 1, whatever, they were illegal. Mm -hmm. And... um, you know, me being in California where this particular thing was not illegal and like us just trying to like, there's there's something to be said around uh, generative justice as it applies to healthcare and like things like that. And I think that one of the ways that I'm able to process grief uh, when I think about people like Iona, right? Because it was a loss for me too. Like I look at my phone sometimes and like I'll get a message from the, uh, a, a message from the game center And I'll be like, I've never played games with anybody else. Nobody, nobody ever have I played games with on Game Center other than Iona. And I'm not saying that it's her. All I'm saying is that it it reminds me of like a, a very real experience that I had around losing someone, but also gaining someone in my life that I had known for years and just like, I don't know, like, this is all tying back to what does the other side of grief look like? And so I'm, I'm saying all this to say, I'm not really sure there, for me, is another side of it, right? Like, what does the other side of heartbreak look like? Well, we can, we can try and, like, 
think about that in a macro way, but when I think about this one person and the heartbreak I experienced with them, is there really an other side of it? When I think about my mom and the grief that, that you know, has come from her passing, is there really another side of it? Do I want there to be a, another side? Or is grief just the thing that now happens? Um, and it doesn't have to be a bad thing or a good thing. It's just the thing that is a part of the remembrance of the um, the memorialization of, of everything else that we do when someone dies. And so it's like, maybe I don't need to try and get over it. Maybe that's just my perspective, but I don't know. I don't know if there is another side of grief or what it looks like to be on the other side of grief because I'm still in it in a lot of ways. And, you know, even when I think back to my first instance of grief, my grandfather, there are times uh, namely when I was going through all of the heirlooms that my mom left me, where I even grieved for him again. So it's like, does this ever really stop, you know? So that's what I think. What about you? What do you think? I just, I think you learn how to, you get more tools to learn how to live with it in different ways. Real quick, jumping back to Iona and Fruit Ninja and the Game Center. <laughs> an episode on shrinking, fucking love that show on Apple TV Plus, and it was called Boop. <laughs> yes. The part of me feels like I am very, very aware that Iona will boop, you know, from time to time on this side in her own way. So part of me feels like that was a boop. Uh, I like that. You know, you know how we'd be saying boop this new because okay. like, wait, but you know what? You know where that came from? So on Reddit, whenever there's like a cute like puppy or like a really cute like cuddly animal, you know how like puppies and cats be having the cutest little noses? And like, you know, when you usually, it's like you want to boop it. You just want to like boop the snoot. And so, but it's, there's also like boop when you got, when you catch somebody and something's like boop or when you need to bring somebody back. And so it's like one of those like multifaceted words where it can mean so many things. But yeah, no, I understand exactly what you mean when you I say that. It. Yeah. yeah but, but, um, I, but I am, I am in, I am in loud agreement with you on, I don't know if you're, you know, there is another side of anything versus like you just ne what you are moving through is the other side. Now yeah. you didn't know how you would be able to handle it prior to it happening. And now you, you are, you are being guided in your own way um, and finding ways to deal with it because you like you just mentioned, you you'll go in and out of it. Yeah. How do you see your life now with the passing of your mother? Would you consider this a life interrupted moment? It's a very real part of my life. Um, and it's a big part of my identity now too, right? Like having no parents, no grandparents. I feel like I've actually assumed the role and the literal, the literal role of being an orphan, you know? So I'm kind of left in a lot of ways to navigate this planet now on my own. And while I do have chosen family and extended family, it's a different thing. You know, my mom was the last living parents or I, you know, I didn't have I didn't, my grandparents on both sides, been gone for a minute. And then my dad passed in 2014 and, you know, so, and I, and you know, I, I had a stepmom and she's cool, but like we weren't close. So it's like, it's just me. And so, yeah, like it's it's a it's a, a very real part of who I am, and it's showing up every day. I think, in in very real ways. What would you have named the title of that chapter before your mom transitioned? So, I in thinking about this question, I I thought that I would use song titles, because I thought it would be the easiest way to kind of name. And so since we're talking about my mom as being the most recent or my, my most recent uh, confrontation, if you will, with grief, there was a song that kept playing <laughs> during the, the time. So my mom got diagnosed in June of 2022, and she passed in September 2022. It was unexpected. She did have stage four um, pancreatic cancer, but she was being treated and unfortunately the chemotherapy was just entirely too strong for her. So she had a, a reaction um, called oral mucositis, but it was a very severe reaction and it wound up being too much for her immune system. And so she died suddenly towards the end of the summer. But 
During the summer, there was this song by Mac DeMarco, and I have listened to Mac DeMarco for years. I've been a fan since maybe like 2016. Um, and I'd never heard this song, and it was called, and it's called Freaking Out the Neighborhood. And so loosely, the song goes, um, I know it's no fun when your first son gets up to no good and starts freaking out the neighborhood. And being my mom's first son and only son, you know, that automatically resonates with me. And in this song, he kind of is speaking to his mom and, you know, he's talking about, don't worry, you know, I'm fine. And it's so funny because I'm not really sure if Mark, Mac's mom is still here or whatever, but it almost sounds like a posthumous song. Like it's like something that he would have said to her afterwards. And, um, you know, it was something to me that like, I just, it completely resonated. And I just kept hearing it over and over and over again all summer. So I'm like, either the algorithm got me saying something over Siri and they like, we gonna play this for you. Or it was just something that like I resonated with in the moment. But yeah, freaking out the neighborhood Mac DeMarco. So if anyone is listening and they want to hear that, I think you should play it because it's a really good song anyway. What um, would the title be now? Okay. So this song, and this is this just came to me recently because like it came, I was like, I was stoned. I'm like in LA. I don't think it might have came on while I was in the car. And I've heard this song a million times because my mom is the person that I'm very eclectic. I listen to all genres of music and I have since I was a kid. My, my earliest recollection of music was um, Erica Badu Baduism. And I remember my mom had the CD and she would play it for me. And she would also like put me to sleep to jazz, like real jazz, like CD 101.9 in New York jazz. And um, so I had heard this song like, you know, a million times. It's Keep Looking by Sade. In this song, she is speaking about the world and like how you shouldn't let, let it get you down and no matter what, keep looking. And the lyrics to this song, like I, my, I, I've heard my mom play this song. She had all the Sade albums, honey, okay? Sade was a staple in our household. And you know, it was like the, the moment it came on, I mean, any usually if you know Sade, you ain't got to hear too much of it for you to know, oh, this Sade. And, you know, even if I know all the words, I know this song. And so when it came on, I was like, mom, you are, this is for me. Like, she's playing this song for me right now. And I swear to you, like, I have maybe heard this song, like, maybe 10, 10 or so times since I've been back in L.A. I got back to L.A. from being out east, you know, dealing with all of the the uh the the uh what is the word i'm looking for the bereavement if you will and i've been back since january it's now april or it's march going into april and yeah i've heard the song a few times and like it, it's just it has that like very has a very sobering tone to it right and it, it also sounds like instructions right it's like and yeah, it's, it's, it is where I'm at. It is the title of my life right now. It's keep looking, keep moving. Don't, you know, let anyone get me down. Don't let them bother me. Like she, this is it. That's, that's the, that's the tweet. <laughs> so keep looking. Sade. So yeah. Yes. Okay. <laughs> so. I love that. I love that. Yeah. Kaz, I know you, you are not a social butterfly, but you want some things if you want to share. Where can people, you know, keep up with you if you want them to keep up with your ass? Yeah, child, I got a strained relationship with social media, being an early adopter and just seeing how it has chewed people up and spit them out, but also made people famous and whatever. So, it, you know, a gift and a curse. But personally, I don't spend much time on social media. I am digitally off the grid if you will and i think i'm gonna lean further into that um on my next birthday which is in a couple weeks here to just really breathe and properly grieve right you know um erica badu has a song not to get long-winded and off topic and she loosely says something about it's hard to um grow when you're growing publicly and i feel that way sometimes you just gotta like Close the door and do your thing behind closed door. Everybody don't need to see the part, don't need to be a part of the process. Mm -hmm. And so I've been very, very um, intentional about who I'm involving in my process of grief as it stands at this very moment in time. Saying all that to say, I will share my email address, which is somewhere that anyone can reach me at. And this is my business email address because I have another email address for like the me me. 
Um, and so it's simply Sean Asia at iCloud.com. And that's S H A U N A S I A, like the continent, at iCloud.com. Every time, like, it was so funny because every time y'all would say your last name, it would be like Asia, like the continent. Right? Yeah, it's, funny. It's, it's the way people be trying to like do the mental gymnastics and be saying all the words other than Asia. I'm like, girl, like it's a whole continent. Like, what do you mean? It's just Asia. I'll put that in the show notes. As thank well. you. Thank you. Huh. Grief is a interesting thing to talk about. I think about my sister often, maybe because I know she's so close by literally and has her own way of booping me from the other side. I think about where I am and how that's evolved from where I was a few months ago, stewing in that dark space. I'm being more intentional about the way I want my life to look now and not falling ill to society's ideals of where they think single black women or womb bodies with no children should be in their late thirties. There are going to be moments where we won't have language for the things we're grieving, or the language changes based on the mood we're in, and that's more than okay. Am I, or is my body still grieving some things? I'm sure we are. I'm just happy to be feeling those feelings again because there was a 15 plus year period when I wasn't. Grief isn't a one size fits all kind of deal. I think we get more tools in our toolkit to navigate it more imperfectly, and that's all right with me. I hope it's all right with you. You got this, and even if it feels like you don't, you do. Until the next episode. Peace. This podcast was written and hosted by me, Georgette Pierre, associate producer Tristan Bragg, and co-producer and editor Wise Grisette for the Indie Creative Network. Music by Otis McDonald, King Canyon, and Bail Bonds. You can follow my conversations on Twitter at Georgette and Instagram at Georgette Pierre. That's G-E-O-R-G-E-T-T-E-P-I-E-R-R-E. You can follow the podcast on Twitter and Instagram at Black Nuance Pod. That's black, N-U-A-N-C-E-D-P-O-D, or email us at blacknuancepod at gmail.com. Spell the same exact way. Subscribe and share from your favorite podcast app. We're streaming on Apple, Spotify, Google, Amazon, and more. Thanks for listening.